Hello and welcome to lecture 10. So uh, we're going to be doing two things today. We're going to be picking up where we left off last time talking about testing and we're going to complete that unit. Uh, and then we're going to move forward onto new material today talking about how we're going to use functional programming to make our stuff more uh, structured. So in particular, I'm actually going to be using the same set of Jupyter Notebook uh, content provided in lecture 9. Let's kind of keep it uh, topically contiguous. So we'll use that to finish up the testing concepts. And then, you know, at some point today, we change over to a new uh, slide deck for lecture 10 for the functional programming introduction. So remember, when we were talking about testing. Oops, let's get over to testing. Uh, we were, you know, very worried about uh, how we know our design is correct. It's not just a matter of testing at the end. But it's also how we had to do test-driven development along the way. And of course, we can use testing to evaluate contributions for people to uh, use our code base and then know they didn't break it. It's also the great reasons to test. Uh, in particular, we talked about there's three important things to kind of do testing, right? You need to figure out some way to generate test cases from our stimuli, and you need to way to know what the right answers to those test cases were. And finally, you need some way to kind of tie it all together. And so we did this with some, you know, very manual examples on Friday. And then we kind of are building our way up to uh, a more automated method where we uh, used uh, either randomization or exhaustion to generate the 10 test cases. And then to know what the correct response was, we used some sort of model, some sort of behavioral scala that mimics the expected anticipated behavior. We used that to know what the correct answer was. And then we also showed some examples of how to kind of glue all this together using chisel test and scala test. So we're not going to recap everything from last time. But we're going to go ahead and remember that, you know, we just get both combinational. And then we just briefly introduced the notion of how we're going to do this for a component with state. So in particular, we're going to test the Q module built into uh, Chisel. So hopefully that's right. But even if it doesn't show any new bugs, we're going to still have a good experience to kind of see how to put all this together. So in particular, this is a great module for us to look at because its uh, functionality is well understood, right? You know, things go into a queue and come out of a queue and they come out in the same order to go in. Uh, and it's stateful, right? It has uh, registers. Additionally, it uses that decoupled interface. So we have a chance to kind of look at how that might play into a test bench. And so, for example, uh, if we're trying to test a queue instance, uh, maybe we'll, you know, take a number of entries and uh, a bit width, and we'll go ahead and, you know, have our input. Remember, for decoupled, there's use a flip to get the input direction. Otherwise, you know, decoupled is kind of by default in the output direction. And we go ahead and instantiate the module from the chisel util. And just fill it in. And remember these parameters from last uh, week ago, where we talked about where this allows us to kind of NQ and DQ at the same time uh, in a given cycle, and we're not going to let it combinationally flow through. Everything has to kind of go through at least one uh, register. You hooked it together. Okay, so we can go ahead and you know define our Q instance. So what's the next step? The next step is to go ahead and build ourselves a model, right? So uh, in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to write a little bit of Scala here to mimic the behavior of our Q. Now. Uh, one of the interesting challenges of building these models is making sure we really kind of capture the right behavior aspects, right? So we saw in the combinational example uh, with our sign and magnitude thing on last Friday, it was important for us to make sure we kind of capture the right uh, truncation behavior of, you know, reduced precision arithmetic, right? Where Scala ints are 32 bits, perhaps we we're working on U ints in Chisel, which are, you know, not 32 bits. How do we make sure we kind of faithfully represent that behavior? Uh, in the case of today, we're doing a stateful element we want to make sure to kind of capture that stateful property, right? Where a combinational block, you know, you give it inputs and you get an output, so there's no need to delay anything. However, a stateful element not only can remember things from prior interactions, but also some outputs may not, you know, immediately affect the output. Sorry, some, some inputs may not immediately affect the output. It may have to go through a state element and then affect the output in the next cycle, right? And so when you're trying to model these registers, you kind of need to make sure your model, uh, in this case, the thing you're writing in Scala, kind of properly uh, mimics that behavior. And so in particular with registers, imagine a register where data is coming in and you don't want data to come out immediately, it has to come out the next cycle. Um, you have to kind of get that right. So the easy way to get that right with Scala, you know, or in other words, building behavior model, is if you read the register outputs before you produce new register inputs, that way you're reading the old valid register rather than new valid register. So for simple examples that like you're going to see here, we're able to do that. We're able to make sure we uh, read it before we write it. In which case, we're going to get the properly delayed value. Uh, that may not always be possible, in which case, you can kind of fall back to a more heavyweight solution where you have to kind of represent your registers as kind of a register input and register output, and you know, you buffer them, right? So 
you update your register inputs, and then at some point you decide to kind of advance the clock cycle, and then you copy the inputs to the outputs, and that way the outputs are reading the older value rather than newer value. Okay, let's look at this particular one for a queue. So for a queue, what are we doing? Well, uh, we're gonna you know go mutable. We're gonna use a mutable Scala collection for the queue itself, um, and then we also need to kind of mimic the behavior to the coupled, right? Where for the coupled, we need you know um, ready and valid for both the NQ and the DQ, right? So for example, uh, we're going to uh, initially say our DQ is not ready to receive. Remember, our DQ is actually going to be kind of like a, a argument. And we're going to use a var. So we're actually going to let people overwrite this. Uh, it's getting a little stateful, a little mutable, but hopefully it's a very careful way. And then when we want to NQ something, we're going to say, hey, uh, try to NQ. And if we're ready, we can do it. If not, you know, the transaction doesn't happen on the coupled. Uh, but if we are going to do it, yeah, we're going to go ahead and add this on to our queue. And then... Uh, what do we have here, right? So then if someone were trying to read the, the, the back end, they're going to try to attempt to DQ, right? So, hey, if there's something to DQ, we can go ahead and give them that data value. If not, we're going to turn minus one. Um, we did already talk about option and none. We can make this a little cleaner. Uh, the reason why I didn't do that here for this, you know, uh, kind of exception case is that on the other end, to actually do the whole testing is defined and .get to me seem laborious. Uh, later this week, we're going to cover pattern matching. You're going to see a much more graceful way to deal with option, in which case then we're start using it all over the place. Um, and then, okay, so NQ ready. Well, how does that work? Well, so we're seeing, is there anything for us to, uh, are we able to accept, right? So number one, we need to have space in our queue, right? So if we're supposed to hold num entries, our current queue size needs to be less than that. Okay. Um, or actually, if we're at the full size and someone's DQing us, that's okay, right? We have that pipe effect, we're that pipe parameter. And then um, what about the, if we are able to DQ with our valid out there? Uh, well, of course, if our queue's not empty, that means there's something we have to DQ, so we're able to give it out. Uh, okay, so let's kind of count up our things, right? So we have our NQ side and our DQ side, and then we have ready and valid, right? So on the NQ side, uh, valid is an input from the outside world, right? So uh, you actually don't see NQ valid. That's kind of implicit by someone trying to do intempt NQ. Uh, and then on the NQ side for ready, as in what our response is to that, well, it's based on the Q state, right? And then for DQ, kind of counting it all up, right, um, we are going to uh, take the ready as an input. In this case, it's a var, it's a little ugly. Uh, and then uh, for our output saying, are we ready to do it? It's DQ valid, you know, okay, defined here. And then to actually perform a transaction, someone's gonna try to attempt a DQ operation, which hopefully will only be called when they uh, really expect this to work out. This will become more clear, we kind of start integrating things together. Okay, so, uh, here we have just a giant wall of text. I'm gonna go ahead and maybe zoom out for a moment. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and play around with our queue model, right? Oops, which I didn't uh, load in. So we're gonna go ahead and load in our queue model. <laughs> and then what are we doing? Well, we could do things like, um, you know, saying we're ready to NQ, uh, and then, um, uh, you know, seeing, hey, is it ready or not? So maybe we'll go ahead and comment a lot of these out so we can kind of maybe uh, wrap our head around what's going on, right? So for example, starting initially as an empty queue, is it ready to NQ? Yes, it is. Uh, is it ready to DQ? Uh, no, it's not because it's empty, right? And if someone tried to DQ, uh, they're going to get uh, a minus one, although they are allowed to NQ, right? Because that's okay. So then if we let it go another cycle, uh, let's let that kind of run. What do we see? Um, yeah, it was ready to NQ. Uh, the DQ is valid. We're able to pop something off, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so this is us just kind of testing that model. And so we perhaps do more rigorous testing later on, but we have some confidence. Hopefully we built an okay model. Let's go ahead maybe and zoom back in and uh, now try to go ahead and use this, right? So what are we going to do? Well, for example, we want to have a queue instance of two entries and keep the math easier to make it work with 32-bit types, just like uh, the ints are in Scala. Okay, we're going to have two entries. Great. 
what are we going to do? Well, initially, let's say, hey, uh, we're ready to DQ. And we've got to do all this work. We've got to go ahead and poke um, from our Q model, you know, let the Q, remember, the model's trying to mimic our circuit, right? So we want to make sure uh, we're kind of connecting the two, right? So in this case, for example, um, we want to, you know, see, hey, is our output ready? And that's going to be mimicking the Q. Okay, is our output valid? That's going to be also mimicking uh, the, the Q model, right? Is our input ready? Um, and that's something we're also kind of connect over, right? And then um, is it valid, for example? Uh, you know, in this case, we're going to say, hey, we're not trying to enqueue anything. We're just trying to turn things on. So we're actually not going to say we're trying to enqueue anything. We can go ahead and put bits on that value, but they're not even enqueuing it. Now, uh, in this next cycle, we're going to go ahead and kind of keep these same connections. I would kind of keep doing them over and over again to kind of reevaluate these Scala methods, right? Uh, but then now we're actually going to say, hey, let's actually try and enqueue something, right? So we're going to say it's valid. We're going to try and enqueue one, and we're going to try and tell the model to enqueue one. And then on the other end, we're going to try and dequeue it, right? So we're no longer going to push anything on, but we are going to say the, um, uh, we're going to see the attempt to dequeue, right? Um, so maybe I'll go ahead and even and put that in there, a QM dot attempt DQ, right? Oops, yeah, right, I didn't take any arguments, correct. And I should zoom out so we can see what the answer is. Oops. So why do we not have our queue? That's surprising we don't have anything there, right? Uh, this should have gone through, right? I'm confused. I'm sorry to have to debug live, but this was not what we had last week. Um, So to debug this, what I'm going to go ahead and do is uh, print the state of the um, uh, queue. So we can see what's happening each step of the way. In particular, we should see things eventually find a way into the queue. Yes, we can see the queue one went in and then why is it then flipping out for the DQ? Is there a question? Uh, we, we did only one push, that's fine. It should be able to not require us to fill both entries. We're going to see in the next slide. Uh, yeah. So if, if pipe is not true, it's going to take two cycles to come out, right? But we said it was pipe is true, so we do think it's okay for it to come out right away. Uh, well, sorry, in the next cycle. Um... Yeah, we said we're ready to DQ. Oops. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thank you. So a student uh, found the real problem. The real problem was uh, my code actually uh, attempted to DQ already and expected it, right? Um, 
So it uh, was looking at the output of the queue and was already comparing it against the DQ. This happens when you don't document your code well enough and you come to look at it four days later. Uh, we actually already did the DQ, so doing it twice is a bug. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very grateful. Um, but yeah, so okay, so this little example we're in queued once and then we dequeued it. The DQ happens here and we have we're expecting for it. So, uh, you know, if it didn't match up, uh, for example, if I was to do something naughty like to uh, say that's plus one, then we're going to get uh, exception because it didn't match up, right? Um, but it does match up. Okay, so it's a very simple example of enqueuing one item, popping it off, and then dequeuing it uh, worked out. So thanks for the help. Okay, so. Yeah, this is already becoming, you can see, untenable, right? There's like a lot of interfaces here we're kind of setting. And so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to start putting these together in kind of more manageable abstractions. And also by kind of having these more manageable abstractions, it's easier for us not to make mistakes, right? You can see, oh my gosh, there's so many signals that are kind of set and poke and expect. So let's go ahead and see if we can't make that a little bit more structured, right? So let's automate that interaction. So to do that, what are we going to do? So here I have to find this function sim cycle. And it's going to take quite a few things in, right? What it's going to do is take in our, our Q model, you know, our Scala model, our actual Q instance uh, that's actually in Chisel. Uh, and then we're actually going to say, should it be enqueuing? And should it be dequeuing? And even actually give it the data, right? Um, so these other things may look a little puzzling, but if you realize that prior interaction, uh, we'll talk about the contents and method in a second, can be summarized like this, right? We instantiate our Q instantiated our model, and then using this automated interaction, those three operations are each, you know, one cycle at a time, and we kind of captured it, right? Where here we are not attempting to NQ or DQ. Here we are attempting to NQ but not DQ, or NQing a one. Uh, and now here we are DQing, right? And internal to this, we're kind of tracking all these things for us, right? So we have a print statement so we can kind of see the Q status. We want to see it. We, of course, can comment that out. Or maybe perhaps better yet, controlled out some sort of logging parameter. But then in terms of uh, you know connecting everything appropriately, well, we make sure the queue model is ready to go with the right DQ information, and that's of course given to us by this parameter. Uh, and of course, and then of course for our chisel module, we are going to uh, you know properly uh, connect over the ready that's dealing with from uh, our model. Uh, as well as um, the valid. Uh, we're, of course, also going to check that against our model, making sure that we know where we are saying it's okay to do at the same time. Um, and then if somebody using this abstraction wants to DQ and our Q model says uh, it's DQ valid, this is essentially fire, but remember this is not you know a chisel type, so you can't quite do fire on that. We're going to go ahead and attempt the DQ, and we're going to make sure that DQ actually matches what's coming from the model. And this, I'm sorry, it's coming from the chisel thing. Expect that. Make sure it actually matches. Uh, we're also going to go ahead and um, set those other things up. We're right? going to make sure that you know our input readiness is matching the model. We're going to go ahead and make sure our input uh, valid uh, is going to match how we're treating uh, based on what this function requested that came from up here. And uh, the data, of course, comes from the data, right? And then if someone says uh, we're trying to NQ, we're going to attempt to NQ. But remember, of course, the queue is full. It's going to ignore it. Uh, and we'll, of course, step the clock. So a lot of stuff. But the good news part is we get this all right inside here, make the abstraction, get the abstraction correct. Uh, then it's going to work out, right? We're able to um, read this maker kind of test cases much more concise. So now we kind of have this own, like, little meta language DSL or something to describe our test cases here where we're going to, you know, do nothing, NQ1, DQ. And uh, yeah, this this works out just fine. Uh, you know, if we wanted to just, you know, go ahead and uh, NQ another, right? No problem. Or maybe actually while we're NQing the second one, we want to uh, DQ the first one, right? It's very easy for us to kind of compose uh, these test cases uh, in this case, right? And What's nice about this is we're describing the interactions, what we want to actually happen in the sequence of events, and the exact correctness is being provided in this case by having a model and hopefully making sure we're interacting with that model correctly. Whew. Okay, a lot going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and maybe pause for questions. Okay. 
Okay, well, well, we have a little bit more to go on this example. So we can go ahead and maybe we want to, you know, for example, not just use that function, but actually maybe do it uh, enough times to actually fill up the queue and then drain it, right? So in this example, we're going to be enqueuing in the fill. So, you know, yes, we're trying to enqueue, we're not dequeuing, and then we're going to drain it. We're only dequeuing and not enqueuing. And once again, note that sim cycle method, we are going to um, ensure that we're kind of comparing against our model. And you see here we are kind of filling it up and then we are dequeuing it. Uh, you know, but we could just as well have made the queue deeper and then it's gonna have to do more to do, right? Um, so uh, that's kind of neat. We can kind of, if we were worried about, you know, how our thing behaves in various cases, right? Maybe we say, okay, well, we can do two and four, but what about one when it's, you know, uh, the kind of simplest case, yeah, I can do that too, um, uh, et cetera. And you can see we actually are deliberately overshooting on these for loops to make sure we actually get that pushback, right? That it's not going to uh, take it when it shouldn't or DQ when it shouldn't, right? Cool. Um, and then, um, so that was kind of us doing these kind of manually human constructed corner cases. Once again, with the same kind of automated interaction, we could define test cases that are random, right? So we can go ahead and run this one, right? Which uh, is going to um, uh, manually choose, randomly choose whether it's trying to enqueue or dequeue. <laughs> and so you can see, for example, that in this particular case, all right, well, we didn't run for very long. Uh, you know, okay, it uh, had two entry queue and then, you know, eventually it filled up with three. Maybe we'll say, we'll let it run a little longer see what happens. In this case, it actually never managed to fill up, right? But that was random. We could just run it again. This time around, um, it does fill up, right? And it, it's perhaps trying to enqueue here, but it can't because the queue is full. This is an example of why you might want, for example, seeding for random test cases. Um, and then of course we made the queue deeper. You know, maybe it's not gonna fill in that case. In this case, it did manage to fill it, right? Based on uh, the randomness, right? Um, and you can see it's, it's not exactly trivial to get the model and the model interaction all perfect. Uh, that's something that's kind of a good thing to do. And it kind of forces you to think about what are distractions are in my design? How do I know they're right? Um, sometimes it's really hard to do, hardly hard to kind of reason about. And that's perhaps an invitation you may want to reconsider how you're structuring your modules, right? Um, thinking about testing early in the design process, not just how I'm going to write this module, but how am I going to design test and test it and depending on the type of module, you may find, you know, okay, we want exhaustive versus random, uh, maybe some sort of model, et cetera, et cetera. Um, think about that stuff early, and so you have that going early, so you can use that for test-driven development. It's really going to help you develop something more robust, right? Because uh, once you have a very complicated big model, or sorry, module, not model, uh, then trying to later make test cases for it or model for it becomes really intractable. And you often might hear, like, a veteran designer saying, like, oh, yeah, well, we have, like, integration tests. That is the entire unit we can test. But you know, like that particular unit, ah, we can't test that, it's too hard to test, right? Some units are hard to test. A lot of times, if you think about your module abstractions, you may be able to kind of finesse units that are easier to test, or maybe you have like a couple of units, some sort of subsystem that's kind of easier to test together. Um, cool, okay, so there's a lot there. So I'm gonna pause for any more questions on testing before we move on to today's uh, material. Okay, um, so yeah, as you saw, we actually posted homework three last night. One of two questions, the question we posted later tonight. Uh, and for the first question, we actually provided a lot of this uh, interaction stuff for you already. We're trying to kind of bootstrap you on that, but we are gonna ask you to write the Scala model for a particular uh, problem, as well as the Chisel implementation. It's actually writing both implementations, but we're kind of providing you enough scaffolding where you can have the interaction kind of already moderated. So hopefully some of kind of see applied uh, right away. So let's go ahead and shift tabs to the um, content for today. Maybe I'll go ahead and clear all the outputs so it's maybe not so confusing looking. Oops, and maybe also we'll go to the first slide. So uh, as you can see from the slide today, we're diving into functional programming. Um, and as you've probably already uh, ascertained over the course of this quarter, uh, I'm not a program languages kind of person. I am officially trained in career architecture, so kind of a very a little very pragmatic, very practical sense about dealing with things, very empirical, very quantitative. But functional programming's got a lot of cool features. And we can use these to make our hardware design processes 
uh, much more productive and much more correct, and hopefully also more readable. And so uh, for those linguists in the audience, hopefully you won't cringe too much when I uh, very much give a very practical uh, description of these topics rather than being very formal about it. Uh, but I think they'll still be helpful. So uh, the big idea of what we're talking about in this whole thing, when I say functional programming, there's a lot of aspects of people mean by say functional programming, but in particular, I'm referring to functional programming. In this course, I'm referring to is the ability to kind of apply functions to collections of elements, which technically is a special case of functional programming. It's more than that, but um, that's kind of what I'm most concerned about. We've already been applying functions already. We've been using functions. We've been using recursion. Um, in particular, functional programming, in this case, we're thinking more about let's think about how we apply the functions to collections, right? A bunch of things we want to apply something to, this is a way to kind of structure that interaction. In order to do that, we're going to need anonymous functions in Scala. We'll see those. And then we'll actually show some of these Scala operators, uh, in particular map for each and zip, and put them together in an example. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and load in Chisel into our uh, notebook. Um, so why use these features, right? We've kind of already taught you enough where you're able to do everything you can do in Verilog in terms of making a design. Uh, and already using you know recursion or for loops in var, you're already able to um, do some amount of parameterization is pretty nice, right? Um, but what these, what these things we're going to show you, I already make that take that one step further, right? Um, the whole point of what we're doing with Chisel is not just to have the type safety and the stuff, but also to build these parameterized generators, right? The idea of getting, having these parameterized generators is to build reusable components. We've already gotten so much mileage out of stuff built in the Chisel util, and we're going to kind of start building own things for our own problems, right? So it's going to be really helpful to kind of get that reuse and build these generators that are really parameterized, really flexible, and Functional programming makes it really deal with those types of things, right? Um, and arguably, if you do this uh, in a kind of a standardized way, particularly using what we call patterns, uh, it's not just more concise. It's not just, oh, I can write this instead of much more lines. Uh, other people immediately know what you're talking about, right? Where normally you have to kind of parse the code a little bit in their heads and think about, okay, what's they're doing here? And yeah, okay, I recognize this. But instead, using one of these keywords and they immediately know where you're kind of going with that. And additionally, uh, if you know where you're going with this and you use that keyword and perhaps you misuse it, the compiler is going to give you an error, right? Versus when the other approaches, maybe it may not necessarily be known errors, right? So one of the odd things about Scala, which is actually really embodied by this approach, is it's our goal to turn as many errors as we can into compile errors. Now, most of us don't like compile time errors, but if it's a compile time error as opposed to a subtle runtime error, <laughs> trust me, you'd rather be compile time error. Um, because then of course we can, we can, we can fix it right away or even better yet, if you're using an IDE, it's going to underline that line and warn you, this is not going to compile in the first place. And you're not going to get a compile time error. You're going to get a, you know, immediate warning from your IDE, right? So this can really help us reduce errors and get things right from the beginning. And it said, with the testing unit, it's also true for the functional programming kind of reasoning, thinking about what's going on with your design, what's your kind of your intent and what kind of abstractions or things are going on. Um, all that being said, one of the kind of main components of functional programming normally is to be functions, right? That is, you know, stateless things that take inputs and produce outputs uh, and have the kind of very clear, very explicit data flow. Uh, that's great. Um, Scala isn't quite a pure functional language, right? It supports mutability, it supports objects and all these other things, right? And so it's a little bit more, even though it has these functional features, it has a lot of imperative flavor to it. And in particular, not just Scala, but actually the way we're using Scala with Chisel, we actually do want side effects a lot, right? It's actually something that's kind of, you know, I've been saying we don't want side effects, but actually we do want them sometimes, right? In particular, things like, you know, in Chisel, um, when we connect things together, even though we may be working on Scala vals, the connect operation is changing the internals of those Chisel objects. And that's a deliberate thing we want to have happen, right? So uh, we're gonna do these, you know, use these functional programming kind of patterns we actually are going to have side effects some of the time. We should be very mindful of these, right? Because normally it's not a goal of these operations, but uh, we can go ahead and see these play out. Whew. Okay, so uh, one more kind of overview slide about this. Um, if you think about programming, right, a lot of it kind of boils down to doing something over a collection, right? So normally we think about it as, you know, doing for loops or while loops or whatever, and yeah, it's a big pile of data. You get to go iterate through it and Oh, when you iterate through these, make it iterate through these other things. We have a nested for loop or something, but a lot of code really is some, at some level 
you have a collection and you're going through a collection. You have a collection and you're going through a collection. Maybe making a new collection, maybe modifying the collection, but you're kind of typically working with it, right? And so um, if you kind of look at your usages of these interactions, these collections, you may recognize some typical patterns, right? Some common ways where I'm going to apply some operation to the elements in this way or in this other way. And really all that kind of differs is uh, the manner in which you apply it to the elements. Do you apply it to them kind of all independently? Do you apply them in some sort of uh, dependent uh, order, so maybe some sort of reduced order. And so every time someone does this stuff, you kind of almost reinvent it, kind of run your own for loop or nested flip or whatever. Uh, the goal is, you know, what if we could figure out a way to kind of recognize there's patterns here and to reuse these patterns. And as I said, if we're able to kind of do some standard way, get the compiler to help us check these out, convey information more easily to our readers. Um, so as an example of these using what these patterns might look like, uh, today we're talking about a couple of them, for example, map and for each. So we're going to go into way more detail on these in a minute, but for now you can see on the left, for example, map, we're going to take a collection. So we're kind of representing that as, you know, some number of boxes here inside this bigger box, which is the collection. It's going to take a function. It's going to apply that function to every element of the original collection. And then it's going to produce a new collection, which is the output, right? So uh, you have, you have n elements in your collection. You're going to have n applications of this function f and n elements in your new output collection, right? So that's kind of the most straightforward, you know, just take things and, Input and for every input element, apply f, you know, apply your function, and then uh, you have an output element. Um, interestingly, although uh, map is perhaps you know the, the backbone of the functional programming ones, you'll find out in, in Chisel we perhaps a lot of times use for each, which uh, does the exact same thing except for there's no return value. Uh, and so you might say, well, why would we want to call something there's no return? Uh, it's because you want the side effects, right? So perhaps you want uh, like to print something or something like that, or to do something across it. So you, you want the side effects um, and that's kind of the deliberate goal, right? Um, and so we'll see that play out as well. But I'm just showing you, for example, in both of these cases where, you know, you can imagine what these might look like in code. It might look like, oh, this might be a for loop. Uh, and this might also be a for loop, but now we're differentiating these two cases, right? Where in one case, we're kind of producing a new collection, in another case, we're not, but we still want to kind of have the effect of a for loop, right? Um, this is kind of what's happening, right? Now, if you look at, depending on which language you're using, which semantics and which things you're following, there may or may not be constraints about, for example, the order in which these functions are applied. Those are subtle details, but for now, the kind of big picture is just be aware of our goals to kind of have these patterns where we have some sort of collection or do some sort of operation to it. And using one of these standard patterns, we can go ahead and uh, have a well-known kind of flow through these things, right? So in order to work with these things, we're going to need something called a non function, or in Scala, as they call them, a function literal, technically. Um, so what is it? It's a way to describe a function uh, without even declaring a full function. We're just describing like the core gist of the function, right? And so uh, you can take an anonymous function and then give it a name, or uh, you can, oftentimes we'll see when we use these, we don't even bother naming them, right? That's why they're anonymous. Uh, and so what, what's the syntax? Well, the syntax is argument list, this arrow, and then what you do. So you can put braces here and have multiple lines of expression. Uh, that's totally fine. Typically, when we're going to want to use these, we'll be just fine with it's usually a single line. If the function you're going to be applying really does have multiple lines worth of effort, you can just declare a classic function, works just fine. Um, so let's kind of see these things here. So here we are, for example, uh, declaring uh, a function. We'll go ahead and comment this stuff out for now so you can kind of see the result. So what's happening? Well, this is, you know, a mangled name, but the important thing is this type signature here. We're taking int in as input and producing int as uh, our return value, okay. And so, yeah, so here it's, you know, it's this unnamed thing, which, you know, here is being two stringed as a lambda, you can see, uh, okay. Well, what about if I, for example, really wanted to bind it to uh, a val, I can do that, right? So val uh, inc is now this, you know, anonymous function, but I now have a thing pointing to, it, which is called inc. Okay, sure. I can go ahead and, you know, uh, call that function, right? So even though this is a val, uh, you know, because it's an anonymous function, we can give that as an argument to it and use it just fine. Uh, and by contrast, maybe I want to do a, the way we learned previously for defining a function, we can just do a def like that. Uh, okay, and I can also call the def, right? So at this point, oops, I sorry, I didn't um, uncomment that. At this point, you're probably wondering why uh, we're doing all this. As we'll see in a few minutes, 
It's really helpful to kind of just concisely kind of use these. However, if you want to uh, instead define your thing separately and refer for that name, that's also going to work just fine. It's just more verbose sometimes. And, you know, here we had a single input example, but you, of course, can also have a, you know, two input example, which takes in two ints and produces uh, an int. And I'm going to give a brief uh, preview. This is a tuple syntax, right? So we're listing the input here as two ints together as a tuple. Uh, we're going to see that syntax um, in a few minutes, kind of covered in more detail. But yeah, so that's how we can do an anonymous function uh, in Scala or a Lambda, as you might hear in other languages. Um, so let's go ahead and use it for map, right? So uh, map, as I said, you know, takes each element in the input collection, applies this function to it, and then you have a new element uh, in the output collection, right? So using our super uh, concise syntax here, we're going to say uh, the collection, the map operation, and then the function, right? And remember before I was telling you that uh, these map operations oops, aren't built into the language. They're actually just methods uh, on the collections, right? Um, it's really kind of a good way to think of them, right? You're just kind of applying some of these collections, right? Uh, and so there's also going to be a new collection, right? Um, and although some of these operations may give us certain ordering constraints, you should be very explicit and controlled about those. Uh, but uh, I find when people worry about the ordering constraints, something like map, that may mean you're counting on a certain side effect, in which case you should be very careful about that. So map is good when you don't want to have any side effects, and the whole point is the thing you're producing. Um, so let's go ahead and see an example here. So here to find the function, which takes in a single uh, argument, and uh, you know it adds one to it, sure. Uh, I made a collection, which is just you know uh, zero through four. Uh, okay, so I could you know use the more uh, punctuation heavy syntax and say, hey, on instance of L, call um, this map method and give it the argument ink, right? All right, that's fine. So that's what this uh, thing here is. Say, oh yeah, we you know incremented zero through four by one, so now we have one through five. Great. Okay. Um, Remember from we discussed earlier in Scala, we can go ahead and emit this period and this parens, and this kind of gives you a little bit of a nicer syntax to kind of write it out. So we're applying the same thing, we get the same answer. Now, uh, so far we're using a previously declared function, right? We can go ahead and start using uh, an anonymous function. In this case, we're actually going to make an anonymous function which takes in an argument i, and then we're going to go ahead and apply ink to it. That's one way of doing it. Um, or we could even be more uh, concise and just say, hey, uh, we're going to take in uh, an argument i, and uh, we're going to add one to it. So these all kind of produce the same thing. And so at the end of the day, this is probably perhaps the most natural syntax where we're going to have a collection, uh, apply map to it, and then the function we're applying is going to be an anonymous function, a function litter, I should say. We're taking in the case a single element, and then what's our new element value going to be, right? So remember map, we have one argument coming in, one argument coming out. Uh, cool. Okay, so that's that's map. Um, like I said, this is kind of like a, a classic, you know, thing in these languages. Um, we will be using map. Uh, this doesn't use less often examples today in the chisel, but it's definitely a very uh, helpful thing to have. Okay. Uh, well, maybe we'll keep going. Then let's talk about for each. So remember, for each also applies this function to every element in its input collection. Uh, but as you can see here, right. It does not return anything, right? So like for a map, it applies it to every element, but unlike map, it does uh, not return anything, right? And so uh, the nice part about this is it's helpful for us to um, uh, indicate uh, the side effect is the intent, right? So um, for example, uh, you know, here we have a collection, you know, we made zero until five and we want to print them out. In this case, the side effect is us printing to the terminal, right? So we aren't changing the input collection, but there's a side effect happening, right? Where we want this other thing to happen. It's not about what print line returns, it's about the behavior print line has happening elsewhere, right? And so, yeah, here we've done that. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, for example, swapped out this for each for a map, we would still get the things print. It's still gonna call that function every element, but now we're gonna get a new collection back. And because print line doesn't return anything, returns unit, kind of the equivalent of void, we have all these units now <laughs> in a collection, right? So this is probably perhaps not what you want, right? Now, sometimes people might abuse map and just call map and then not save it in a val. 
If you really intend for the side effects only and don't want to return anything, you really should use 4 each, right? And 4 kind of very clearly conveys that, yeah, I want to take this collection and do everything onto it, um, but I don't really uh, care about returning anything. Uh, and you've already, for example, seen us use, you know, often we might say something like, you know, like, oh, 4i, 0, oops, I should do that arrow, you know, 0 until uh, 5. Uh, and then you might say inside there, oh, yeah, but, you know, print line i, right? Um, by contrast, right, we could now uh, say 0 until 5 uh, for each, right? And oops, maybe I should make that connection clear. For each might be happier if I uh, gave it parens. Or maybe I crashed my own interpreter. We'll find out. Um, <laughs> fun. Um, yeah, I'm getting impatient. I might go ahead and relaunch. Oh, yes. Great question. So the concern was, uh, how does it know uh, what i is? Uh, the answer is it doesn't. So I need to uh, tell it what i is. And then maybe that will save us. Or no, my computer's turned to space heater. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, redo it. Um, oops. So I'm going to have to go ahead and load this back in just for later. Great, and then we were talking about for each. So this one should work. There it goes, yeah. Um, so maybe it's a different way of thinking about it, right? Um, to be honest, this syntax, I think if you're really intending to do this kind of thing, is actually very clear for a lot of people, especially if you're dealing with it like a numbered range. It's kind of very clear what's going on. However, when you have things that aren't ranges <laughs> and are actual collections originally, like, for example, maybe you're working with L, which already was a collection, uh, then maybe that's more clear, right? And you know, perhaps if we're trying to be so concise, maybe we'll kind of all cram this on one line, and that's not super egregious. Um, and you can kind of see it play out. Okay, cool. So let's maybe delete this extra stuff. Great, I'll pause for any questions so far. Cool. Okay, well, let's keep going. Okay, so we just talked about mapping for each. So here's a contrived chisel example to kind of show them uh, used inside uh, a chisel module, right? In particular, maybe I'll go ahead and comment out the map. Uh, map's going to be more helpful with some other constructs we'll see later on. So here we just did a for each, right? In this case, what are we trying to do? We have some number of outputs in our module, some parameterized number of outputs. And we just want to take whatever constant number is and just give one of those right there. So you can see, for example, for everything in our output vec, we're going to call for each, right? So we're going to get an output port. And given that as the input to our func anonymous function, we're now going to take that and then connect that to the constant and of course cast it to a, a uint, right? Um, great. And then, um, so that, that, that works just fine, right? You know, if we go ahead and look at the Verilog, uh, Okay, yeah, we see, for example, we have two elements. Uh, and we're trying to say, hey, we want the value 8. And look, we connect two elements to the value 8. So no need to write a for loop connecting these all together. It just kind of is done for us automatically, right? And so part of what's powering all this is that uh, not only are these operations defined on Scala collections, they're actually also defined on chisel aggregates, right? And as we've seen already, sometimes you'll have a Scala collection, so for example, like Seek, and the elements themselves will actually be chisel objects, maybe really Scala objects, right? It depends on how you're using it. But Kind of the cool part is once you kind of get familiar to this terminology in these languages for like for each or map, it's going to work in both of these cases, right? Um, in this case, we're applying it to a vec, right? But it's okay. Now for the contrived map example, let's say, for example, you had a sequence of, U, of ints, these are Scala ints, and we wanted to cast them to uh, a sequence of Scala, oh, sorry, chisel U ints. Well, you can see, okay, we made our original thing and then we applied map and then was our map operation? dot u, right? And so uh, this is contrived. Of course, there's no impact on the output. This is just something that's going to be pruned away. The reason why I even bothered including this module, of course, is we can't uh, show these without them being inside of a module. But uh, that was just kind of a tossed in for the ride. Um, cool. So that's, that's for each and map. And we'll see them applied to some bigger examples. 
Uh, let's keep going if there's no questions so far. Um, so one thing that's going to help us work with these is a tuple, which you've, of course, seen in our languages. It's a way to kind of group together heterogeneous things. Um, in Scala, it has tuples as well. Uh, and we, of course, indicate these with the parentheses. And uh, when you have a tuple, you can't actually name the members, but you can index them num numerically, right? Uh, so if you do want to access them, uh, you can use the syntax you can see below. Uh, one interesting quirk, that numbering starts from one rather than zero. Uh, you know, most things computer science are zero index. The Scala language designers decided to make this one index for tuple arguments. Heaven knows why. Um, however, it uh, turns out using this kind of accessing methods usually are needed because oftentimes we're going to be able to pattern match or do assignments such that we get the things out we want. For example, if we define a tuple T1, uh, you know, you can see, okay, we define T1 as a tuple. You can see here the type signature of it being a tuple of two ints. Like I said, they can be different types. We can have T2, which is a string int, no problem. We can access the, the members of T1, right, with, the, with that numbered uh, indexing rights, dot underscore one or dot underscore two. And as I said, you try and do dot underscore zero, it's gonna complain. Uh, it defines dot underscore one and two. Um, and then also you can do this assignment trick here, right? Where you can say, hey, I want to have these as individual variables that I can deal with with regards to T1. So this is something you probably need to see more often is we're going to create tuples and then work with tuples with kind of just matching assignment syntax. And so sometimes it's helpful to have this ability to kind of index into them, uh, but not always. Um, this is kind of more common. Uh, in terms of when do you use tuples, uh, I recommend them when you use them when you have only a few elements and usually the producer and consumer are kind of nearby. It's kind of almost like this is like a anonymous fields on like a, a class, right? Where it's like, we aren't bothering to label the members. Uh, normally I recommend, you know, using case classes if you want things to actually, you know, uh, be clear what's going on. Or you can kind of say, hey, this is this field and here's a name for this field. So case class is great for that. Um, likewise, um, if you have a lot of things and they're homogenous, you know, maybe a classic collection works better, right? So a tuple really is best when you have things that are just a few of them and the producer and consumer are very nearby. As we're going to see in just a minute, the producer and consumer may literally be on the same line. We're using these tuples, in which case that's a good example of when to use them. Because um, otherwise, when someone's reading it later on, they're kind of trying to think themselves because these tuples aren't labeled you know, which field is which, right? Um, sometimes a clever variable name, you can make it clear. I often might, you know, uh, put the first element thing name and then and the second element thing might say, you know, like uh, values and indices or whatever, right? whatever I'm storing inside. I make kind of very clear what's going on. Um, let's just see that, kind of see that play out. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's go ahead and advance the slide. And apologies, that needs a slide demarcation. Um, so now talking about zip, right? So uh, zip is a really helpful function or operation to say, and maybe it's more clear if I go to that thing we just cut off, which is the static and what happens, right? So zip takes in, uh, you know, an input collection. You call a zip operation. It's going to take an argument collection and it's going to go through element by element on both collections and pair them together and make a tuple, right? Um, so the result now is I now have a single collection with tuples of an element from each other input collection, right? And it's going to be really helpful because very often we're going to want to do these operations uh, on multiple uh, collections at once, right? We kind of want to not just work on one collection, we want to work on two collections kind of merging together. And often what we're going to do is we're going to use zip first to kind of get these tuples and then we're going to have a function defined on the result of these tuples, right? So let's kind of see that play out, right? Okay, so here's the zip syntax. Yes, we can go ahead and do this. Um, as I said, we kind of use this before we do other things. Uh, okay, so we have, you know, for example, we're defining collection. If we zip them together, right, we see we get uh, a new collection, which is just these things uh, as tuples together, paired up in element, element, in this case, because they're identical going in. We're going to have, you know, identical, you know, elements in each tuple. Um, now, let's kind of start seeing some interesting applications of this, right? So uh, there's a few things, right? For example, number one, if I try to zip something that's different lengths, I get a tuple, which is the minimum of the two. That kind of makes sense, right? Uh, Usually you zip things that are exactly the same length, but just in case this comes up, you should be aware of this is the behavior that happens when you have different lengths. Uh, Counting this behavior intentionally is a little bit, you know, surprising to a reader. So maybe, for, for example, maybe help them out a little bit by making them aware of this. Um, and then in terms of how we can maybe apply this, 
Maybe we'll zip them together. So now we have a collection of tuples like we saw here. And then here we are immediately applying a map to it, right? We're going to immediately apply that map operation. And then uh, to deal with that tuple, we're going to use a turn this tuple into two variables, A and B. And then we can go ahead and add them together. So you can see that behavior. Yes, we're adding up, you know, these tuples just fine. Um, but this word case that kind of crept in there. Uh, that's part of that pattern matching syntax and scholars we're going to cover later in the week. For now, uh, just understand that when you want to uh, make one of these anonymous functions uh, works with a tuple, you're probably going to toss that case keyword in there, and it'll work just fine. Um, you, I'll just to show you what the error looks like without it. Uh, you're going to see it. Uh, it's not able to kind of uh, match it up. And this gets such a common thing. It's like, by the way, you probably want to do pattern matching. You should put case in there, right? So there's Scala's error message is saving today. Okay, cool. So that's that's zip. Um, so now with zip, we can go ahead and this is going to be perhaps more 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 useful for us, right? So let's imagine an example module where we want to take a vector as inputs, produce a vector as outputs, and um, uh, apply some function. In this case, function we're applying is uh, we absolute value, right? So we're going to mux. Basically, if it's less than zero, we're going to invert it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to leave it alone. OK. Uh, so if we did this the way we learned previously, we would you know, define our function. And you know, maybe do a for loop for a number of elements. And then you know, for every output, connect to the input. And that's going to work just fine. Uh, you, know, you can see the Verilog is a little bit messy here because it's doing a signed Verilog. But you can see what's happening is, of course, it's first defining the subtraction uh, and then for the outputs, right, it's uh, doing the comparisons immediately, right? So here's a comparison used to in a mux, and then you can see either you're going to get the negated version or the original version. Okay. So that's uh, doing that kind of with the folder we kind of covered that already. Now let's go ahead and use the things we just learned about uh, and see what happens. Well, we get the exact same output. We had a even much more concise uh, thing. And perhaps maybe it's even more clear, right? So what are we doing? Well, we have our output ports, uh, and we're zipping those up with the input ports. So now we're giving tuples, which are output port, input port, inside the same tuple, right? So you're going to put those together. Um, and so with those tuples, we're going to use that case to pattern match. And then, you know, with O and I, what do we do? Well, we're connecting the output to, in this case, the application of, you know, the function on the input, right? And so, uh, you know, here we've done that, you know, very, very concisely, uh, right? And, you know, I guess if we wanted to get extra concise points, maybe you could even uh, apply this directly in here. I would argue it would just be excessive, not be overkill, <laughs> uh, especially because, you know, here we're kind of, you know, giving the reader a knowledge of what we're, this operation does by, hey, this does abs, you know, it's probably absolute value. That's a good hint what's going on, right? Whew. Okay, uh, questions on this example? Okay, um, let's keep going. So uh, there's one uh, nice little bit of Scala syntax we can play with. It's called a, a placeholder, right? Uh, and so what it is is we're making these super super concise, uh, you know, um, function literals or anonymous functions. Uh, you notice how we kind of have to have to go through the effort of having a argument list uh, function body. Argument list function body. What if we could just get right to the function body? So that's what these uh, placeholders are for. So we use the underscore, and it's just going to apply it right away. So these are equivalent statements, right? So instead of if we want to do something that's just plus one, well, we're just trying to do plus one on the input. So rather than having to define the input list separately, we just say, hey, uh, take this argument and do plus one, right? Um, now. At first, you might say, these are amazing. Oh my gosh, I can make everything so short and so concise. Yes, it can be great, especially when it's something that has a really simple, clear purpose. This makes it more clear, which is great. Um, you can imagine this can be very perilous if abused, right? So let's kind of talk about some of the ways this maybe goes south. 
Um, one way this might go south is, uh, what if I do this, right? What's happening? It blows up. Why is it blowing up? So every time you use the underscore, it's moving on to the next thing in um, the argument list. So uh, in this case, for map, right, map only has one argument to the function. Uh, so really, this is kind of saying, I need a second argument. Well, there is a second argument. That's the problem, right? Um, so, uh, you know, if you want to use something more than once, you're probably better off maybe giving it, you know, uh, this name, and now we can use it more than once. If I want to do like i plus i, no problem, right? That's easy to do. Um, cool. Um, also, if you have a lot of arguments, it's not as kind of hard for you to keep track of this. So typically, in user placeholders, I would be surprised if it, ever made, if it made sense to do this for anything more than two arguments. Um, but it's still kind of nice, right? You can kind of still get that more concise um, syntax, right? Um, and it kind of plays together for us. Cool. Uh, and so now let's kind of think about how we know about declaring functions in Scala, right? We learned how to do def the long way. We learned how to do uh, a function placeholder, sorry, function literal, a anonymous function. And now we have anonymous function with placeholders, right? Super concise, right? We're just trying to say, hey, I want just, this is the body, get right to the meat. Um, and some of it's kind of helpful to do these. So let's go ahead and see the next example, um, which is going to be a little daunting and maybe we have time to do it in five minutes or not. So this is the uh, arbiter from last Wednesday. And we're going to redo it. Remember, maybe I'll kind of recast the problem and you'll start seeing perhaps which maybe last week it seemed very intuitive. Oh yeah, this is the use of four to now we're gonna change it to functional and I'll just show the before and after and we'll talk about the details on uh, the next lecture. So here's the before, right? The before is we're writing up our own arbiter. Remember our arbiter has some number of inputs and only one of them gets connected to the output and we're choosing that based on a fixed priority from our priority encoder um, and to convey the factor and maybe not accepting an input we used a couple to kind of give back pressure um, and so what happened? Well, we had all this stuff, right? For example, we kind of wanted to aggregate all the valid from incoming uh, wires. And so we had to, you know, make a wire wrapping around a VEC and then we connected them all uh, here and then we used them later on. Uh, we also wanted all the bits coming in into a single VEC. We had to go ahead and connect these with a the for loop here and then we use those bits later on. Uh, and then we also wanted to kind of give a default value to all these things. So we had to kind of do that, a lot of stuff. Okay, let's go ahead and see what happened to it. Boom. Like, even if you don't know all of the meanings of all these lines, it's definitely a lot shorter. So let's try and talk about what's going on, right? So for example, going back and forth, right? Looking at the difference between the valids, uh, previously, oops, previously we, um, you know, made a wire of VEC and then we had to kind of go through this loop and connect them all. Uh, now, uh, we um, are just simply uh, doing that as a map, right? So we had a collection for io.rec, right? So it's a vec, and we're mapping that. And here we are using that placeholder syntax, right? So I could just as well have said, you know, oh, for i input, you know, go ahead and do this. But I mean, that's kind of verbose, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and use that placeholder syntax. So boom, I'm just grabbing all of the valids. Um, now let's temporarily ignore how you set the output value. There's a little bit of boilerplate there. Uh, meanwhile, um, how do we feed that uh, priority encoder, right? Before we had to kind of give it our invalids, we did that. So we got a uh, one hot signal coming out as our chosen one hot. And remember we had to go through all this effort to um, uh, take our chosen, then turn it not into one hot, turn it, take it into, back into a uint and then assign that. But chosen one hot's kind of already we want. We want, you know, n bits to kind of attach to our n inputs or num ports inputs, right? And so we have our chosen one hot from the priority encoder. Let's go ahead and attach those to the outputs. So here's an example of that zip for each combo we saw before, right? So we're taking our, our IOs, so the requests, remember to request, even though it's the input, the ready part of that thing is actually going as an output, right? Uh, and we're zipping it up with these chosen one hots and then we can go ahead and just attach these, right? So for each of those inputs, dot ready, right? We're connecting it to that bit from the one hot chosen and we're attaching that 
we're ending with io.fire. If you don't want these to always be true, we only want it to be if it's actually firing. Um, so that was kind of encapsulating that when from the prior slide. Remember that prior slide, if I go back one, there was that when. Okay, then a few more little details, right? Uh, how about the bits? Well, so remember the prior one, we, um, for the bits, we declared a vec of wire, you know, wire of vec, and then we connected them all manually, and then we were able to kind of pass that into our mux one hot. Well, here, we're able to, um, we just kind of plug that in right away, right? So it's very much the same kind of thing we did here for the invalids. The only reason why I didn't even bother naming it is because we only use it in one place. We just put it in there directly. Maybe I can go ahead and be more explicit if we really wanted to. In this case, you actually see I use invalid in more than one place. So it's kind of helpful to have that uh, named, right? But for all those bits being passed into this MUX, we're taking all those input ports and we're just mapping them to that bits field. So boom, that, that's there, right? Okay, and then for the finale, what's this vec init business? Well, we wanted to um, do an or reduction. That is, are any of these valids uh, one? Or right, it's kind of what we're trying to find out, right? So um, uh, this or reduction feature is great. It takes a, a uint and you know sees if any of the bits is one. Essentially, right? It's taking an or reduction. Now that only works on uints. Uh, and what do we have? Well, invalids is a uh, vec of, um, uh, it's a, a vec of, um, of, uh, rex, right? And we need to go ahead and, sorry, it's a seek of bool. Sorry. Thank you, uh, for my TA for reminding me that what happened is by mapping it, we now have turned into a seek of bool. And now that we have a seek of bool, uh, we need to once again, remap it back into vec again, the cast of two you went. So there's a lot of weird casting going on, but all this casting is really just get used this or reduction feature. What we're going to cover on Wednesday's lecture is how to do a reduction. And with a proper reduction, we won't even need to uh, go through these hoops. We can just do the reduction directly. So we'll cover that there. So reduction is an example of a way we kind of, kind of start aggregating results of these uh, functional operations. And with that, I've gone uh, over time, but we also finished uh, the last slide for today's lecture, which is perfect. And we'll put this up uh, on Wednesday. So have a good day, folks.